I'm just saying that it's um, even after a year, it still feels slightly strange doing talks online rather than in person. Um, but uh, um, but we've all kind of got used to it. So. Uh, so this evening I'm going to talk about uh, shop fronts and uh, I'm going to give a little bit of a sort of background history to um, how shops evolved and the, the features that, that you might see in shops at different periods. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about um, signage and advertising which is kind of quite central to the way shops look and um, then I'm going to show you some uh, projects that have been done elsewhere and in, in other sort of cars and similar projects, so you can get an idea of the kind of thing that might that might happen in, in Mabel with the cars project. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to talk about James Duncan, and uh, who was a tile firm in, in um, Scotland. And there's a sort of direct link with the former Mabel co-op, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that because I thought you might be interested to hear it. And sort of ceramics and tiles, and particularly James Duncan is a kind of Add on interest of mine as well as um, the shop fronts. So um, here we go. So the um, shops are, although they're quite, a lot of them are quite small, they can be quite complex because there's a lot of things that actually um, uh, influence how they look. And uh, one of the, the main things is when, when they were built, but also um, what retailers have occupied them over that time. Um, and what they've wanted from the shop and the shop to look like. Also the, the parent building, so the, the building that the shop sits in, what, what it's like in terms of um, its size and, um, and appearance, and that, that influences the shop. Uh, the materials, so what, um, what, what it could be built with, um, whether that's stone or, or, or other materials. Um, quite a major, um, influencer is uh, how much money the retailer had, how, how affluent were they, and certainly in the 19th century, for example, the, um, the drapers, big drapers, had lots of money, so their shops were, were very grand, but in a smaller place like Mabel, the shops would have been smaller and plainer, um, because the, the retailers there in, in more rural areas of Scotland would have had a lot less money. Um, and But even those shops, um, in rural areas were, were maybe not as grand as in cities, um, they often kept up with, with the fashions and wanted to stay relevant and uh, may have used things like sign writing or, or um, uh, new materials to try and uh, jazz up their shop in order to keep it as fashionable as possible. So we'll see some examples of that as, as we go through. So the, um, the early shops um, really kind of evolved in about the 1780s. That's when we start to see shops that we, that, that we as we understand them today. And the um, this shop in uh, the the one on the red one here um, is what's called a high bow front. So the the bow fronted shops um, were are what we sort of imagine um, sort of Georgian shop fronts to look like. They didn't all have bow fronts, but they all would have had small panes of glass because glass was not um, not available in uh, uh, larger panes at that time. Um, many of you will be familiar with the Sanker uh, Post Office, which has been there since 1712. Um, of course, this, this window doesn't, um, or arrangement doesn't date to then, um, but it's, it's later. And actually, I think there's been work done to it and bits of it have been sort of replaced. Um, but it is, um, uh, probably a um, you know around 1800 or or that that time the actual um, when it uh, developed a bow front. So um, when you would have walked down a street, you would have seen that kind of bow front, um, and so it was very much a, a sort of statement piece um, in a street at that time um, that this was a shop, and it allowed a greater display area and more light to go into a shop than there would have been from just a normal a normal house window. Um, so I was talking there about the small panes of glass, and glass was a very um, important influencer on shop design um, during the 19th century. Um, the um, technology um, gradually um, improved over the 19th century, and uh, in the 1830s the Chance Brothers um, developed plate glass, 
and uh, this allowed much larger sheets of glass to be made. But the, the glass tax um, was still in place until 1845. And the glass tax actually um, taxed it according to weight. So the larger the sheets of glass, the heavier they were and the more tax people had to pay. So smaller retailers would not have been able to afford this and would have still have had, um, well into like the middle of the 19th century, would have had sort of small panes of glass like this we see on the left um, and George Street and Pear. But this is an example, a very grand example in, in London. So the date here is 1841. So this predates the lifting of the glass tax and is a very, very elaborate um, and uh, shop front. These are cast iron columns um, and it is a, you know, a really sort of vast cavernous um, shop. So very, very much a statement um, from this um, very rich uh, drapers. But few retailers would have afforded something like this and much more would have been of this, of this type. So this um, shop in Perth um, um, shows that how shops actually started to make the windows bigger. So um, you can see that there's still panes of, um, small panes of glass, there's not one single pane. Um, so they're gradually, um, we're getting rid of the, of the small panes. Um, see the console brackets here, this is the start of, um, these came in about in the 1830s, this sort of decorative, um, um, sort of blocking of the end of the shop front. And uh, console brackets are still used today, and um, so they've been a very enduring feature of, of traditional shop fronts. The storm doors with the little um, sort of rectangular entrance. And you can see that in this um, shop in uh, uh, Southbridge in Edinburgh, and um, very similar design. Here we've got um, uh, horizontal window panes. So these would originally have had the multiple panes and have been taken out. Um, and interestingly, you can see here, there's an archway um, on this side here. And this, um, so this, this was the earlier design. These have been um, removed and replaced with this square headed opening. And this was the, the sort of more fashionable um, style of the 1840s. The, um, uh, the, as well as console brackets, we also see the introduction in the 19th century of pilasters, which is this detail here. So um, these sort of, um, they're, they, can, they can be quite plain, um, uh, like on these shop fronts. Um, this shop front in Kelso's uh, got some double uh, ones on either end, but um, they became more decorative as the, as the period went on. But again, they're another very enduring feature and they're very um, much used today in, in shop fronts to mark um, the, the, the shop front and to provide a little bit of decoration. They're just planted on, they're not structural in any way, um, but, they, um, but they're an important um, traditional feature uh, uh, of shop fronts. Um, towards the end of the Victorian period, at the end of the 19th century, we see um, a much greater use of decoration and also the use of cast iron. So in conjunction with plate glass and cast iron, we see the opening up of windows, um, so much more light getting into shop fronts. Um, and also cast iron was an um, incredibly versatile material which could be sort of molded into um, all sorts of, of shapes. And uh, there, were, there were many, many um, companies in Scotland who um, exported all around the world, in fact. So this is a McFarland Saracen foundry um, shop front, which is up in Cromarty uh, in the north of Scotland, and very, very beautiful example. Um, the, um, this feature here, this console bracket, shows how um, elaborate everything was starting to become. This is sort of shell like detail, um, um, dentals along here. So, um, this is very typical of the 1880s, 1890s, seeing this, this level of decoration. The other feature that you see um, in shop fronts at the, towards the end of the sort of 1890s onwards is um, encaustic and geometric tiles. So these um, little coloured tiles, which you may have seen in some shop fronts, there might even um, be some in, in Mabel, um, are, um, if you see that, that, those tend to date to, to the late Victorian period. Um, so here's another example, um, which is in, in Cumnock, and uh, this um, this is sort of really an incredible row of little bungalow shops. Bungalow shops are, are single-story lock-up shops, 
um, and this um, sort of few kind of um, ecclesiastical detail here um, with the panelled soffit at the, above the door, um, and again these sort of geometric tiles. So this uh, dates to 1897, um, very elaborate, and also got cornicing across the top of the shop here. Um, so nice detail and pilasters. So very very decorative um, uh, shop fronts, um, but not unusual for 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 the very end of the 19th century. By the time we come into um, the Edwardian period at the early 20th century, um, there remains um, quite elaboration of the shop fronts, but um, in a slightly different way. So we see the, the use of curves and curved glass, um, and also the incorporation of the name into um, mosaic entrances. That's very typical of, um, of uh, Edwardian shop fronts. And this, so there's a sort of elegance um, and um, to, to um, Edwardian shop fronts that's sometimes missing from uh, Victorian shop fronts, which can be a bit more brash. But um, we also see the use of uh, exotic hardwoods, uh, brass, and um, just um, these sort of flowing lines, sort of inspired by the Art Nouveau um, sort of style. And uh, we also see the use of um, of stained glass, um, often like this detail in the in the, the clear story of the shop front, which is the section right at the at the top of the shop front, and. Uh, so um, we see this um, just sort of nice, nice details. Um, also, uh, again, here's this sort of um, uh, the name incorporated. This is a, is a shop in air. So the name's incorporated into the mosaic and uh, sort of curved details. Um, this is sort of polished granite here. Um, and these sort of um, Art Nouveau type um, stylized um, uh, uh, decoration. By the time we get to the 1920s, um, things dramatically change. Um, and this is um, as a result of the, um, the Paris exhibition in 1925. The art, um, architects were invited to do some designs for the exhibition. And uh, the, um, this is an example of that. Um, I think this was a perfume shop, it was a perfume shop. And uh, so what they did was they, get, they got rid of everything that had been built up over about 100 years. So all the, all the um, pilasters, um, the console brackets, all of those things, um, the um, elaborate stained glass, everything has been removed. And um, we have this sort of Art Deco inspired uh, geometric details, smooth, um, you know, it's, it's you know, really a watershed for, um, for shop front design. Um, but some of this, the materials that had been used in the 19th century still prevailed, and um, this is um, a shop which I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, um, in Ayr, the, um, the former Alexander store. So um, the ground floor has obviously been quite substantially altered. This is an old photograph, so I'm not sure if it's M Co. Um, still on the ground floor. But upstairs we've got this sort of cast iron facade. Um, and this is a great photo that's um, that's on scran with um, you know and it's um, tremendous. So this sort of huge area of um, of glazing to allow maximum light in, but um, it's just the, the use of cast iron here. So it was um, you know um, a, a very important material right into the into the twentieth century. So the um, I was talking there about the um, the nineteen twenty five exhibition. And um, as well as uh, the sort of stripping away of things, the, there was this encouragement of, um, of, of new materials and the use of things like chrome and um, polished steel, um, but also vitrolite. Vitrolite is a kind of um, coloured glass that came in, in sort of sheets, almost like tiles, really. Um, some were quite small and um, some of you may have had a bathroom with um, vitrolite um, if you had a 19... Uh, 30 says, or even 1950s says, it was still used into 1950s, 1960s. Um, so as a particular uh, kind of colour, if you um, are, know Glasgow well, you'll, you'll know Ruganos. So this is yellow vitrolite um, and chrome. Uh, this is on Rothsey. Um, I haven't been there for a while, so I'm not sure what, um, 
who's, who's in there, I suspect it's not McKinnon's, um, but it is a, a really marvellous uh, material and was used to completely refront shops and um, produce this sort of modern look in, um, in the 1930s. And I'm sure many of you uh, know this shop. I believe West Coast Fisheries are no longer in there, um, but this is, is one of the um, uh, really fabulous um, uh, vitrolite shops in Scotland. So this is, um, the lettering here is all, is all etched into the, the uh, vitrolite, the black vitrolite and painted. And then there's this, this cockerel um, detail which sits on here. These are um, our lifting windows. So the, the windows um, open up um, like a like a sash opening window, um, and that allowed ventilation into the shop. It allowed the um, the slab, which you can see here, to be cleaned out into the street, and um, it was much easier to display the fish um, uh, in that you know by reaching in from the from the outside, as it were. So it's a very practical thing. Um, some actually sold through the the, the um, the lifting window, I suspect in this case, probably not just because of the arrangement with, um, with this terrazzo in, in the inside. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a problem material because, and you can see some cracks here and there is some bits missing um, because it, uh, it's no longer manufactured. It was, it was made by Pilkingtons, but they don't manufacture it anymore. They stopped in the 1960s. So if you need repairs, it's, um, it's a very problematic material. Um, the other thing that um, were, was popular in the 1930s um, is window screens, and I've just got a couple of nice examples here. So you can see here um, in, in this nice um, ironmongers in Thornhill, the, the window screen sitting there. So, so they allowed light to still come into the shop, and you can see that in this shop in Danoon. So um, but at the same point, it, it, um, it creates a barrier so that the, there is a separation between the shop and the window. Um, and you can um, you can see that here. These are I've got taller screens because this is really quite a big window, um, whereas this is all glazed. Um, but they're still a nice feature, and um, and a lot of shops still still have them, which is is, is quite good. But they were they were very fashionable in the nineteen um, the nineteen thirties. Um, and this is just a, a slide just showing the, the sort of post war variation. So um, the the post war period sort of you know, sort of 1950s onwards gets gets quite a bad press, um, uh, often um, deserved to be honest, but there are some really nice examples of, um, of early um, or sort of mid-century shops. Um, this particular example is the Joseph Walker, it's uh, Walker's shortbread in Aberlour and they've got a big factory in Aberlour and this is a really, really beautiful shop. Uh, it's in bronze and travertine marble. And um, where you get this sort of angle, um, this is very typical 1950s and um, early 1960s, um, where you get this sort of offset asymmetrical detail. That's but that's um, and you see it here. This is, um, <clears throat> is 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 not symmetrical. Um, so, but they're actually becoming increasingly rare. So it's it's quite important to not dismiss. Um, shops of this age because they could actually be quite important. So, um, and I just put in the panel buildings in Princess Street, which are quite controversial. Um, and, um, but you know, they are what they are and they're part of the, the sort of historical development of Princess Street um, and are, are um, category A listed in recognition of their, of their architectural importance. So, um, so what makes a great traditional shop front? Um, there are lots of things that contribute to that. I think um, good proportion is really important. Um, the sort of combination of materials, um, how the shop is designed and um, the opportunity to make it quite individual um, without uh, compromising the, the townscape. Um, and many shops make a really important contribution um, to the townscape. I, I often include this this photo in, in um, my talks just um, because there's something quite, I, I, in taking the photograph here, I'm standing right on the other side of the road, so I'm standing quite far away, but you can actually look through 
and see right to the back of the shop. You can see the paintings and that sort of draws, draws you into the shop, being able to see not just what is in the window, but actually what is beyond. Um, and it makes that a nice place to be in, in the shop. Um, but it's a, um, you know, a, a perfectly proportioned shop and, it's, um, and there's nothing particularly elaborate or anything about it, but it's, it's just timber and glass and masonry. Um, and it's got some quite nice console brackets and things, but just the proportion and the layout um, is really quite, um, it's quite perfect. Um, so the way a shop looks um, is, is, is very important and the um, and signage and advertising are the thing that can make or break how something looks. Um, and I like this um, little photograph of, um, a historic photograph of a, a shop in Mabel, um, partly because because the signage here is quite it's quite simple, but they've used little little details here. So this would have probably been done by a local sign writer. Um, and he's actually, when you look at the lettering, it's actually quite quite clever. He's thought about it, and it's been quite thoughtfully done. And um, in his added little flourishes, but there's other things here that they're they're using. So they've got the the um, the, the the number presumably of the street. They've got um, the bike sitting outside with the advertising here. It's got his window display, and also, as was very um, uh, common, to have the carcasses hanging up outside um, to show the meat. They obviously don't do that now, but um, so there's a number of sort of advertising things going on here, and um, that all contribute to to um, to the shop. So I'm just going to uh, run through some um, sort of examples of of different. Um, sort of advertising and signage just to, to show you some of the variety that is out there. Um, because I think if you're if you are a shop owner and you're thinking about changing your sign or um, then it's always worth sort of looking around and seeing what there is because there is some very creative um, things out there. Um, I really like this and um, it's, it's actually quite an unusual detail this um, um, convex, get convex, concave, convex uh, detail here. It's just really nice lettering um, sitting on this signage, um, and uh, it's um, you know it's, there's there's nothing overly fancy about it. There's just some nice lettering um, and being quite well signed, uh, written, and just you know it's it's quite subtle, but actually it works. Sometimes um, less is more. And these are um, really lovely examples um, in Sankar and uh, Kukubri. So, um, so this is uh, this shop has just got a fascia. It's not got any console brackets round about it. There's actually uh, beautiful tiles um, in this this butcher shop, um, but the whole thing all sort of just works together. Again, it's not an in your face signage. It's um, quite simple, but actually um, it's very effective. And I think this. Sh um, shows just how, um, this is actually a shop that, that has got a domestic frontage. Um, you know, it's not, it's not a really uh, altered to be a shop as such. So they have to um, use little hanging signs so that you know that it is a shop. And uh, I think the color combinations here of the green and cream actually work really well. Um, I like this one, this is, I don't know if this is still here. I took this a number of years ago. But, um, but I just, you know, it's just what you can do, just a little bit of creativity. Um, somebody's obviously thought about this and, and made this sign, which is, um, you know, which is quite, it's quite clever and, um, you know, adds to the townscape. Um, and just these sort of examples, this is, um, which is a bit blurry, but this is, I was in Amsterdam and when I was walking down the street, you could see this huge sign and I thought, I wonder what, what that is. When you got there, it, it's actually it's a button, and this shop actually sells nothing but buttons. And these door handles are actually like buttons as well. And um, you wouldn't think a shop could sell nothing but buttons, but it does. And this sign is absolutely beautiful. It's all um, beautifully carved in, in timber. So um, you know, there's nothing kind of else. There's a little sign there, but um, you know, it's but it draws you along because you sort of think, oh, well. What, what is that? You know, so you go and have a look. Um, uh, during the 19th century, um, having these sort of three-dimensional signs was, was very fashionable and this um, boot sign, so some of these, these still survive today, for example, boots, the chemist, another chemist, maybe have a mortar and pestle and 
um, those sort of things, uh, barber's poles and that um, are all sort of hanging on from the 19th century sort of signs. Um, and this is in Parney Street in Glasgow, this Trans Europe Cafe sign is, is, is great and I, um, I really like this. Um, and it just shows you what you can do with, um, this is actually the same type of fascia as, um, as the shop in, uh, in Kilmarnock, but um, and it just shows, you know, you can do something really quite creative just with, with, with some paint. And this is just um, an example uh, in Glasgow, again, of um, the Tinderbox Cafe, which I'm, I'm sure some of you will know. Um, it does, they do have a little kind of modern sign here, but this is, this is actually a modern building. Um, it's quite an understated um, shop front, um, but, and the signage doesn't have to be huge. I mean, this is a, you know, um, a chain, but, you know, they've gone for quite a subtle signage and I think that works really, really well here. Oh, I've put, oh, I've liked that one so, <laughs> so much that I've put it in twice. Um, oh, that's funny. Um, anyway, the, um, and I just want to show that, that, that sort of, um, I think it was a hanging basket, so I was sort of showing. Um, the displays are um, are really important as well, you know, to have really nice displays in your windows. Um, and just the sort of whole feel of, of a shop front is really quite important. Um, and uh, I love these ones in Dunoon, you know, with the, with, um, the sort of brushes. And um, this is an optician shop. Um, and this was um, for uh, Remembrance Sunday. Um, it's a hardware shop in, in, in Bridge of Allen, and I just thought it was, it was just like really nice and quite thoughtful, so and eye catching. Um, so it's amazing what you can do um, with your uh, with your your shop window, and not necessarily for for a lot of money either. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to move on and just talk about some projects, um, some of which I've been involved in, um, and uh, to to let you see the. Um, the kind of things that, that, that can be done with shop fronts. Sometimes you get quite surprising results. Um, so this these were these were done a while ago actually um, in Stirling and uh, um, I was involved in the um, uh, giving advice on these these shop fronts. So this is uh, Victoria's Cafe, which um, which was very young, prepossessing looking shop actually, um, with this sort of timber boarding. Um, so I did some research and it turned out that it had been a butcher's in the 1930s. And actually, um, this was probably originally, it probably had vitrolite cladding and probably the vitrolite had got broken and, <clears throat> and had been replaced. So um, the, um, they took the cladding off and um, the, the architect did a, did a design for it um, using uh, new, new stone cladding. They took all the paint off the the, um, the chrome windows, put a new shop gate on, and then this little sort of teapot sign because it's it's um, so it's a coffee shop, um, and it looks looks really good. This is um, actually etched glass, which is quite um, common in the nineteen thirties. So um, and um, it's actually behind here. It's got this sort of original um, sort of grill that they had for it, uh, it being a butcher's to allow ventilation in. So. Um, so the, the effect is, is, you know, was really quite um, striking compared to um, what they had before. And they got rid of the roller shutter door and just replaced it with this nice modern shop gate, um, which um, was all that was needed. You know, it's not it's not a jeweler's or something where where it actually requires of um, you know such a high level of security. <clears throat> So this is um, just a few doors down. Um, this was a alu modern aluminium shop front with tiles and uh, um, this sort of lowered fascia. So it was really um, not an attractive shop front at all. But what survived with this was this really interesting uh, fascia dating to the 19th century. And uh, so the architect did a design, um, as it was uh, Pollock Hammond Architects did a design in timber for a complete replacement shop front, but retaining the original fascia. And you can just see it here. Um, it's actually got a sort of horseshoe de design on the console brackets. And um, they put in this timber shop front with um, uh, pilasters, which is, you know, sort of typical late 19th century detail. Um, and the recessed door. So um, it's quite important, a recessed door. Um, 
it's um, and a lot of small shops or some shops, modern shops tend to bring the shop door to the front. But actually, that sort of um, recessed door creating a little lobby is creates quite an interesting rhythm along the street. Um, so um, it, it is important to retain that um, if, if it can. So this is a very successful um, uh, new shop and, um, and, and looks, looks really good. <clears throat> um, this was a project in Perth. So, um, so uh, this shop had been bought and they wanted to do some work to it. So they started the work and they could see the original console brackets were, were here, um, dating from about the 1850s, 1860s, perhaps. Um, and this is the door. When they um, started to take the modern materials off, they found underneath this lovely um, old sign and uh, this beautiful um, uh, uh, hand-painted lettering, which is absolutely gorgeous. Um, dating to probably to the 1880s, we did some um, research on that. And you could see that the original door was actually here, and these would have been the two windows either side. So um, <clears throat> some archive uh, evidence was used, some photographs. Um, I think this is the shop here. It's one of these ones, it might be this one. Um, and also the um, Dean of Guild plans uh, were uncovered to show, I think it's this one here, um, to show how the shop had, had looked as well. So Dean of Guild plans where they survive are uh, absolutely invaluable records um, of, of what um, who architects were and, and what, what they proposed. So this archive research helped inform what was, was to be done. And this was the result. So, um, it's, um, so the console brackets were retained and um, the, the central door was reinstated. There was some discussion um, about bringing the shop door to the front and they were quite keen on that. But, um, but actually, I hope you can see from this the importance of having that door recessed because it does create um, a feature that, that um, makes the shop feel the way it should um, and actually making it flush would have um, distorted the appearance. So, um, so that um, was a really brilliant project and when you look, compare to this photo down here and see, see the difference between them um, and you know that's not it ended up being slightly more complex and probably more expensive than they had originally planned. Um, but actually, it's just a stripping away and um, of, of, of what was there and reinstating. Um, this was another really interesting project in Trinet um, over in East Lothian. So this is um, Shack. Um, didn't look all that, that great, to be honest. Um, so again, they started stripping off the materials and underneath was this beautiful uh, sign, which they reckon was um, late 19th century, uh, gold lettering. They found a little ventilator at the top here, um, some tiles on here, um, the original um, pilaster with the sort of roundel and a fluted console bracket. So they found the tiles um, on the stall riser underneath these green tiles and this tile panel here. So it had been um, the Danish dairy. Um, so um, <laughs> I'm just listening to the um, one of the voting vans going past. Um, it'll be on the recording. So um, so this was the um, what they found underneath. And these were really quite badly damaged, but actually the tiles in the lobby were in, in pretty good condition. Um, and this is what they ended up with. So they, um, they got new tiles for the stall riser, um, and, but they retained the, the, um, the ones in the lobby here. They got new tiles uh, for the lobby floor, and um, this, there was some joinery work done, but this is all original, the pilasters and console um, brackets um, and cornice. All of this is all original and retained. And uh, the, um, it was um, painted by Robin Abbey, who um, sadly died a little while ago, um, but he was a very experienced um, sign writer and, um, and, and hand painted um, this signage. And um, at the time I was a bit 
um, I was a bit unsure about the colours that they were proposing, but but actually it works really really well and works brilliantly with the um, with the with the tile colours. So um, it's it, when when you look at it, it's, it's kind of quite understated, but actually it's it's, it's a very powerful shop front in in the street and um, very very effective uh, conservation project. So um, my last excuse me, last few slides are just going to be about James Duncan Limited. So, um, as I said at the beginning, I'm, um, I've got a bit of a passion for James Duncan and tiles. Um, I've done quite a bit of research on the firm and uh, I've written some articles um, for the uh, Tiles and Architectural Ceramic Society um, on this, this firm. Because um, as I started to go around looking at shops, I got more and more interested in, in tiles. Um, as I went. So, um, so I, I thought I would, um, because there's a direct link with Mabel, I, I thought I would do a little bit about, about them. So the firm started in around 1865, um, founded by uh, James and George Duncan, who um, uh, they were born in Aberdeen and they moved down to Glasgow. Um, we're not quite sure when, probably, um, possibly late 1950s. Um, and it was run by, by James um, primarily, and, um, but on his death at the end of the 19th century, it was continued by not James's um, uh, family, but um, his brother George's uh, three sons. They operated until 1965, when it was sold to Tofflo Jackson, the marble contractors, and it was finally dissolved in 1977. This rather poor photograph, I'm afraid, but this was actually their um, premises, their showroom in West Campbell Street in, uh, in Glasgow. So um, there was quite a bit of mystery about James Duncan and what they actually did, but they were they were tile. They seemed to have been tile designers and tile layers. They didn't manufacture tiles, um, and, and instead they used the blanks of the big companies um, who were down in the the potteries of of England, uh, Moore and Co and Tina Boot, um, and then they they decorated the tiles and sent them back up to Glasgow, and James Duncan laid them. They, there was no tile manufacturing of any extent in Scotland. Um, they made other things like cast iron and um, uh, ships and things, but um, tiles was not, not something that, that was manufactured other than on a very small uh, um, sort of scale. So, um, so it was much cheaper to get tiles uh, made down in, uh, down in England, much more cost effective. Mm -hmm. So they're, um, they're very distinctive, uh, the Duncan tiles. Um, they use something called the tube lined um, technique, which I'll, I'll, I'll show you shortly. Um, most of the tiles are, are signed. Um, so here it's JD Limited. There's sometimes it's James Duncan um, or J Duncan, Glasgow. There's, there's a very variation, but they are, uh, they're usually signed. They tend to use green and white tiles, um, occasionally blue. Um, they have egg and dark. Um, border tiles and they um, distinctively use um, large murals which are a frieze around the top of the shops and there are a number of surviving examples. Um, they tend to use um, Scottish scenes, uh, some of which are real and some of which are not. Um, and every single mural is, um, is individual and totally unique. Um, so this is tube lining. Um, sorry, <laughs> equal reversing outside. Um, uh, so this is it. so it's like um, it's like taking a tube of toothpaste and putting it onto a design. Um, so they did that onto the um, the blank um, uh, biscuit tiles, and then they um, they fill the it, it with glaze and fire it, and it produces this these sort of three well they are three dimensional kind of designs and um, great variations in the glaze. Um, it's a very skilled thing um, and uh, would have um, been quite intensive in terms of, um, of the, the sort of work involved. So here's a nice example um, from a former um, butcher shop in uh, Kempel Street in Gurukh, which um, is now Original Artists. And is, um, if you're in Gurukh, definitely um, um, uh, go in and, um, and have a look. It's, it's 
tiles all around the, the top of the shop and um, scenes of the um, River Clyde. It's absolutely, um, it's absolutely beautiful uh, with paddle, st paddle steamers and um, lighthouses and things. It's, uh, it's absolutely um, gorgeous. Um, a lot of you will be familiar with the Buttercup Dairy Company. Um, and there are a number of examples that survive throughout um, Scotland. Um, the Buttercup Dairy was um, started by um, a man, Andrew Ewing, and, um, in the early 1900s. Um, he started in Kirkcaldy. He eventually had um, huge um, headquarters in Leith and Edinburgh, and he had over 250 shops across um, Scotland and some into the north of England. Um, so they were really, um, um, you know, sort of in competition with others like Templeton's and Lipton's and, um, and similar uh, kind of businesses. Um, but they had this very distinctive uh, uh, design. Um, I've included sort of two designs here. So this one, um, which was uncovered a few years ago in, in, in Glasgow, in the shop in Glasgow, is extremely elaborate. And I think this is probably was the original um, design that they used. Um, the, the design came from um, this painting by Tom Kerr. Um, and Tom Kerr was in the same church as Andrew Ewing, who, who set up the Buttercup Dairy. Um, uh, he, was, uh, um, he was a very religious man, um, to the extent that all the eggs that were laid by his hens on Sundays were given away. He didn't want to make money from eggs that were laid on a Sunday. Um, so they knew, knew each other through the church. Tom Carr painted the um, Scots Porridge Oats um, uh, shop putter, which you, I'm sure you've, you've seen. Um, so this sort of lovely, gentle sort of um, painting was then sort of translated into this um, design for the Buttercup Dairy. So you can see here that this later uh, panel is, is, um, is, is slightly more simplified than this one. And I think probably uh, they decided that this was um, far too labour intensive and they've gone for a slim, simpler design because they, you know, initially they probably didn't know that there was going to be 250 shops that all needed a design like this. So they would have um, then simplified that. And they also had a um, mosaic entrance. Um, so with the letters M um, um, Buttercup Dairy Company um, and the sort of green and white tiles that I was talking about, um, you can see just, just here, which were, were, were very common. Um, and I just want to show you this. Um, this was uncovered, um, had a sign on it, but this is the original um, uh, uh, sign, Buttercup Dairy sign. So this is a, um, a sort of V-cut lettering into a piece of timber and then gilded, and then there's usually a piece of glass over the top. And uh, this is Malcolm Fraser here, um, architect who uh, some of you may know um, or have come across. And um, the um, it was a... a a lamp shop and um, antique lamp shop, but they've taken it over and um, now got this sort of lovely um, office space within this sort of historic shop and the stained glass, this gorgeous stained glass, um, which always looks better, it's like a church, you know, always looks better from the inside when you're looking out. Um, so this is a really nice project in it. And, you, you know, they, they don't mind that they've not got their sign saying Fraser Livingston Architects, they've got um, buttercup dairy, but you know it, it doesn't matter to, to them. You know they don't need um, need a sign that says what their architect says. Um, so um, so it works it works really really well, and um, I think they've done a great job in in restoring and, and retaining that that frontage. Um, so just my last few slides, just sort of finishing off, um, is just the, the Mabel project, which um, I'm probably slightly preaching to the converted here because I'm sure you all you all know about it, but um, I just thought I'd finish off because it's because um, I do talk about it a lot in, in, in the talks that I do because I, I, I think it's such a nice project um, and it's something that I was involved in, you know, um, with the conservation officer had, had asked um, my advice on it. So this was a building um, in its um, rather perilous um, and sorry state. Um, so I had visited to have a look and try and take some photos of, of the interior. Um, and um, as I say, that these um, these murals around the walls um, is very typical of the of the of James Duncan, um, and so we see these sort of um, scenes that are um, 
kind of ephemeral, as it were. They're they're not real, but some of them are. So this and, the, and this one is quite interesting because it's got it's quite English um, with sort of thatched cottages, and um, you know it's not. So these are sort of Scottish scenes, but these look much more like you know, sort of English scenes. And you can see here the um, the egg and dark detail and the green and white. So this had been a um, the, the butchers um, of the of the co-op building, um, but of course it was and um, the building was to be demolished and the local firm um, uh, Jameson had taken it apart and um, had done this marvelous project taking all the tiles off, which um, and uh, and this was um, uh, uh, I got to go and have a look at them when they were um, had been uh, taken, um, and it, this was just to say that that often on the back of tiles the um, some of them have marks, so you can see where the original, um, uh, uh, who, the, who manufactured the tiles. Um, so this is, um, I think it's a tier in our book one, um, rather than Lauren Co. Um, so this was them being all laid out and cleaned up. And this was, um, I saw I visited when they had the, um, the, the event to, to um, show them off to the community. And this, I think we reckoned was, was Whitby Abbey, which is um, rather curious as to why um, why that was in a shop in, in Mabel. But, you know, it's a really marvellous um, uh, project to see those um, because, you know, often they would just have ended up in a skip somewhere. Um, and, um, you know, over the years, I'm sure there are many, many Duncan tiles that have ended up in a skip. So it's it's really fantastic that they are actually on display for, um, for the community to to still enjoy because they're um, have been part of the the history of, of of the town, and that's just the one in Sankar, which um, is a butcher shop in Sankar, which I'm sure you're you're familiar with um, as well. So um, that's me. I hope that um, but I'll stop to around and uh, give you some food for thought. So thank you for listening. <laughs>